the Housing Finance and Policy Committee will come to order. And we have our first order of business, very, very important, and that is to say happy birthday to Representative Tice, <laughs> who's, <laughs> for the record, celebrating today. Um, uh, Mr. Wilcox, would you uh, take the roll, please? Houseman. Present. Howard. Tice. Present. Egbaje. Present. Bliss. Present. Gomez. Present. Hassan. Hassan. Hassan is present. Thank you. Heinrich. Present. Her. Present. Jurgens. Present. Olson. Olson, Barr, present, Ryer, present, Madam Chair, we do have a quorum. Thank you. Um, next order of business is uh, approval of the minutes from Tuesday, February 2. Representative Howard, have you had a chance to review the minutes? I have, so moved. Representative Howard mo uh, moves approval of the minutes. Um, any discussion? If not, you can unmute yourselves and, and all those in favor of the motion say aye. 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 Opposed, nay. Motion prevails and the minutes are approved. Members, today we have um, three tenant protection bills. Um, all three of these bills go to judiciary finance and civil law, so they have another stop to make, which is why we're taking them early. Um, we uh, all have our stories and experiences that, that inform us when we uh, deal with a particular issue. Um, I'll, I'll share mine. Mine is a, a granddaughter who is a student at Hamlin, and as students often do, um, she and her friends rented a house uh, adjoining the, the campus. Uh, and this uh, house had, uh, had so many mice that it, to demonstrate it, she showed a video one time of her jumping on the couch and the, and the mice all scattered from underneath the, uh, the couch. When they moved from this rental, uh, they had to throw away all the furniture because of, of the uh, nature of the, of the infestation. And they didn't get their damage deposit back. And uh, that is uh, apparently so common a, a response, not getting your damage deposit back, that last week I was watching a situation comedy and it was actually a punchline on the situation comedy. So. Um, at any rate, we all bring our various uh, experiences to, to the discussion today. Um, all three of the bills are, are um, authored by Representative Herr. And our first one is House File 398. Uh, would you uh, like to move your bill, Representative Herr? Yes, Madam Chair, I'd like to move my bill to be referred to the Judiciary Committee. Representative Herr moves that House File 398 be recommended to pass and be re-referred to the Committee on Judiciary Finance and Civil Law. Uh, welcome and uh, uh, proceed. Thank you, Madam Chair and members. Um, so today I stand before you with three bills. The first one is House File 398. And, uh, you know, I think that what I, uh, I having been on this committee uh, for two years and this being my third year, I want to start off by first saying that, um, uh, you know, that there are good landlords and there are good tenants. And the, the um, I want to set the stage that this is never about punishing landlords or trying to, you know, tip um, the scales to benefit one group versus another. It's a lot of these bills, actually, most of these bills provide clarifying language, provide better structure, provide um, less ambiguity in the current statute that exists, uh, and also providing greater guidance. And so uh, these bills are really, yes, it is addresses a certain segment uh, of the population that is uh, dealing with certain uh, issues as being tenants. And that what I, the reason why these are important is that I would like for us to remember that landlords are the one who write the leases. That means that inherently the balance of power lies uh, with the landlord versus tenants. And that um, there are bad actors uh, on both sides, but that we do know that when the balance of power is tilted, that we need to figure out how to make sure that people are protected so that they don't lose their deposit like uh, Chair Hausman's uh, um, you know, niece did uh, in a situation that they could not control. Or, or, and so I just want to make sure that we understand that this is just really trying to level the playing field 
Um, but the truth of the matter is, is that Minnesota tenant landlord laws have not been revised, uh, have not received uh, revisions for decades. Uh, and this isn't just a couple of years. I mean, it really is decade and the pendulum had swung really far uh, into the, um, uh, you know, onto the side of the landlords and less in the sides of tenant. And what we're trying to do again is just level the playing field. And so the three bills before you um, is what is necessary in order to create some of this balance. And so uh, before presenting the bills, uh, I just want to, I just have one more note and I want us um, to remember that we are talking about not just apartment units, but we're talking about people's homes. And I think that when we remember that, um, you know, whether you own your home and you have the rights to do whatever it is in your home, you should have those same rights uh, in an apartment uh, when you're renting or you're leasing, that those rights uh, exist because yeah, it is your home. And so uh, with House File 398, this bill deals with three issues pertaining to heat and repairs. Minnesota renters deserve to live in a home that is warm. Um, this is especially, you know, uh, necessary and critical during this time of which like our uh, climate change has created huge uh, fluctuation in weather patterns as we all can see this week, it has been extremely cold. And that if they don't control the thermostat, their home should be heated to 68 degrees between October 1st and April 30th, wherever they live in the state. You are pro I'm proposing a statewide heat code. And so I just to, for people to be aware that there are already heat codes in uh, many cities across uh, the state. And this is just uh, bringing consistency uh, at statewide. Um, I'm also proposing that, that uh, more housing uh, issues be considered emergency repairs. Uh, while uh, I do have testifiers who will be, who will be talking to this, I'm, I don't think that it is a lot to be asking that uh, essential um, needs within your, your home, whether it's an elevator and you know you are somebody who needs the elevator to be able to assist you to get up into your unit or that if you have medication that needs to be refrigerated, that those things are also the, uh, the expansion of what is considered um, emergency uh, that we expand upon that. And then uh, finally, within this bill, um, the current cost for a tenant uh, to file a court case uh, concerning emergency repairs is $300. That's much higher than what uh, um, other court, uh, if you are to file uh, in other courts, it's only $70. And so we want to make sure that we just put that into parity because if you are already in an emergency, asking you to pay $300 up front um, is a challenge for many, many people who are already overburdened with the price of rent. Uh, and so this would just uh, bring it in more consistency with other types of filing fees. And so with that, Madam Chair, I do have a number of testifiers and I will. Uh, have uh, them speak. I don't have the order or the list in front of me, and I think that maybe I'll uh, I, I'll uh, first uh, call Samuel Spade from Homeline, who's joining yeah. us. Um, welcome to the committee. Please identify yourself for the record, Mr. Spade. Thank you, uh, Chair Houseman. My name is Samuel Spade. Um, thank you for the opportunity to testify today. I am an attorney at Homeline and Homeline's research director, and I've been a housing attorney there since 2009. I've advised over 15,000 residential tenants during that time. And Homeline itself is a statewide nonprofit organization. We do a number of different things, but primarily we provide free confidential legal and practical advice through our tenant hotline to residential tenants in Minnesota. Since its founding in 1992, we've advised over 260,000 renter households throughout the state. And our hotline currently is averaging about 1,000 calls each month. We've included a packet of materials from Homeline for each of the bills today. And in the first packet uh, for House File 398, there is a one-page summary of our clients at Homeline's uh, statewide hotline that we advised in 2020, including a list of some of the most common issues that people contact us about. Um, a week and a half ago, I also wanna, I know that you guys heard testimony about common issues renters face from one of my colleagues, House Attorney Ahmad Furion along with testimony from a number of impacted tenants and Dr. Brittany Lewis, who has studied the impact of evictions and attorneys from other civil legal services uh, facing harmful housing conditions and treatments. And I hope that provides some of the context on the need for some of the reforms that we're talking about today. Um, and I am gonna share information on a number of the bills that improve tenants' rights to heat, emergency repairs, fees, privacy, and the ability uh, to end a tenancy due to medical need. Um, and as Representative Hurst said, the first bill covers heat and repairs. Um, will you find, you'll find a one-page summary of these issues uh, and proposals on the next, the next page of the packet, I believe. Um, but with that, I do want to start with heat. Uh, and given the sub-zero temperatures we're all experiencing this week, um, I just want to point out that Homeline has already taken about 50 calls this year. 
uh, I think it's actually up to 51 as of today, about heat. Um, and it can be a serious issue. It affects uh, children, seniors, and in emergency cases, it can cause serious habitability issues as well, frozen pipes, complete displacement from the home. Currently, there is no state law regarding minimum heat requirements in residential rental properties. Many uh, cities have adopted uh, various requirements, as was just pointed out, but this has resulted in a mixture of requirements that vary from city to city. Beginning on page three in the packet we provided, you'll find some examples of local city ordinances, uh, such as from Bloomington, Owatonna, and Worthington, that actually provide four different minimum supplies of heat in rental property. Um, we've abbreviated the city's code uh, to the most uh, appropriate sections and highlighted the relevant provisions in the packet. So for example, you'll find that on page five, the city of Bloomington requires heat to be at least 68 degrees Fahrenheit in rental units. On page six, you'll see that Owatonna also requires that, but only from October 1st to through May 1st. Um, and you'll find on page eight that Worthington requires a minimum temperature of 68 degrees as well. And these are just three examples of dozens of ordinances throughout the state that require an assortment of minimum temperatures. Uh, these temperatures range anywhere from 60 degrees to 70 degrees, and they cover a variety of time periods. Some are year round, others like the Owatonna example are specific to winter months. Not only do cities have differing requirements, but many cities actually have no requirements. They have no heat requirements at all. And a number of cities only require that the heating systems in a rental unit be capable of reaching or maintaining a certain temperature. They don't actually require landlords to do so. Over the past 25 years of Homeline's uh, history, taking calls, talking with tenants, both through our experience, but also uh, through our educational trainings with landlords, social service providers, and many other community members, this inconsistency between local requirements creates a lot of confusion and in some cases results in renters living without adequate heat. In a state like Minnesota at a time like this, in the winter when we're facing uh, such cold temperatures, uh, it should be inconceivable that some of our neighbors who rent their homes might experience inadequate heat or a lack of heat simply because someone else controls their heating system and can unilaterally decide for them what the temperature in the home should be. This bill uh, remedies that by requiring landlords to maintain temperatures of 68 degrees Fahrenheit from October 1st through April 30th. This would be a floor. If the tenant does not control the heat, uh, and, and sorry, this floor would only apply if the tenant does not control the heat, uh, and it would make this requirement a part of the covenants of habitability, which is important because it means that tenants can then enforce this requirement. Uh, it would track with what many cities in Minnesota already require, and is something that all Minnesota tenants should be able to expect in their homes. Um, I, as Representative Hur said, I also want to talk about emergency repairs and court fees. We regularly field calls from tenants who are facing a situation where due to the disrepair of a critical part of their home, their home is nearly unlivable. These emergencies range from losing water, heat, electricity or plumbing to the threats of condemnation and more. The statute that Minnesota currently has only explicitly lists a few things that qualify as emer emergencies. They are running water, hot water, heat, electricity, and sanitary facilities. It does have a catch-all for other essential services, and that's very helpful. Uh, but years of experience in talking with tenants, again, has taught us that it is not always sufficient and leaves a lot to chance and confusion. Landlords and tenants may disagree over what counts as an emergency repair requiring the tenant to file a court case to resolve the issue. They don't know how a judge will rule. They have to convince a judge. They have to do more work. The tenant has to do more work to convince a judge that the issue they are facing is an emergency because it's not explicitly listed. And for that reason, the list of explicitly listed emergencies should be expanded. The catch-all category will remain, so there'll still be that catch-all category, but the expanded list will help tenants, landlords, and judges know what can be considered an emergency, and this will provide clarity for everyone. And being able to designate as a, a repair as an emergency is actually very important to tenants. Tenants can still obligate their landlords to follow through and fix non-emergency repairs, but it takes much longer. In general, a non-emergency repair can actually take the tenant anywhere between one to two months 
if they have to file a rent escrow or, or, or work with an uncooperative landlord. That's a long time. And a tenant, but a tenant can normally get an emergency repair fixed in a week or less, sometimes as little as a day or two. And so the ability to say that this repair is an emergency versus just a regular repair has a very large impact for tenants in their homes and what they can live with. The bill expands uh, this list of emergencies to include no working refrigerator, no working air conditioner if one was included in the lease, non-working elevators, serious infestations, the loss of any conditions, services, or facilities that pose a serious and negative impact on the tenant's health or safety and condemnation orders, or sorry, health or safety, and also includes condemnation orders. Um, and for each of these issues, I would ask you to consider how quickly you would feel the need for them to be fixed if they happen to you. Again, we're talking about the difference between a repair getting fixed in a few days or a few months if the tenant has to go through the court system with an uncooperative landlord. And that's a big difference. And because tenants do not have control over their facilities in disrepair, they can't simply go out and fix these things themselves. They're not allowed to. This bill gives more protection to tenants facing these emergency circumstances. Finally, this bill addresses an issue with the outdated court filing fees. Uh, currently, if a landlord fails to comply with a non-emergency issue, the tenant can file a rent escrow for approximately $70. This is set by law at the same price as conciliation court, and the goal is to keep these kinds of cases affordable for tenants. However, non-emergency cases uh, don't fit this. Neither do serious emergencies or lockouts, such as when the tenant has uh, been locked out of their apartment illegally by the landlord. For these cases, the filing fee is approximately $300. And, and while many low-income tenants can't apply to get these fees waived, uh, there are many who cannot. Uh, they might be just above the line and get it waived, uh, but they'll still have difficulty paying the bill. Or they may have difficulty navigating the court process to do so because it costs, uh, it takes uh, more time and energy to fill out those forms as well. Uh, and these fees, therefore, serve as a serious barrier to filing these types of cases, these serious cases. And ultimately, it prevents tenants from seeking remedies for conditions that are very important to their health and safety. So the bill would also reduce the cost of filing a lockout or emergency tenant remedies uh, to the cost of filing a rent escrow to a, that approximately $70 fee, um, making them more accessible to tenants facing these issues, which again are among the most serious issues faced by tenants. And uh, at this point, I would be happy to answer any questions. I think we'll uh, take all the testimony and then we'll and then we'll okay. get questions. You'll be you'll be around. Mr. Lockett is joining us as well. Uh, welcome to the committee. Please identify yourself for the record. Good morning, Chairman Hosman. It's an honor to basically be here today. I am here. And just please okay. introduce yourself for the record. Uh, my, my name is Matthias Lockett. Welcome. Continue. All right. Thank you, ma'am. Good morning, Chairman Hosman and the members of the committee. My name is Matthias Lockett, and I currently live in Brooklyn Center, Minnesota. Uh, I have come to you today to talk to you about the heat and repair issues that I've had with my landlord. Um, from the past two years, I've been living here. My spouse and I, we rent out a single family home over here in Brooklyn Center. That was not up to code whatsoever. Uh, within that time, the, the landlord had to replace the water heater, the furnace, tree removal, and of course, the list goes on and on. For example, last year, our furnace went out. Uh, when the heat went out, it was so cold in this house that my husband and I had to stay at a hotel for a week. Uh, within that time, um, the landlord did not basically take care of all that at that time. So we had to be delayed for a week. And that was basically close to Thanksgiving time. Um, it basically, additionally, the furnace issue has not even still been resolved right now as we speak. To this day, the entire house do not able to maintain heat as well as um, the concern of a fire hazard because we had to buy two fireplace furnaces that have the electric heaters to heat up some of our rooms in the house. The legislation goal is to include a broken refrigerator, a stove, working pipes, and safe electricity and infestations, as y'all discussed earlier, as an emergency repair that will help us as well 
when our refrigerator went out. Uh, we notified the landlord and they did not fix it within 24 hours. Due to that, we basically lost food that we just went grocery shopping for. That came almost close to past $300. So when that basically happened, um, the committee, it shows that she didn't even reimburse us for the food at all. Um, it took the landlord a week to basically get the refrigerator. And guess what, lo and behold, it was not even a brand new refrigerator. It was a refrigerator out of her, her own house that she gave us. That made definitely major inconvenience. Now, now regarding infestations, currently right now, we have a bees hive nest that's in hibernation right now in my basement. And we basically show that that's going to be, can be very painfully harmful because during that time, I slept when the seasons changed, when it basically came into the fall, went into the winter, I swept up so many bees, it didn't make no sense. Now, finally, an emergency tenant remedies action can protect renters to ensure that the emergency repairs can be done in the right way. This is so important because our landlord has a notorious history of basically having outside people, not even professionals, come in and do these repairs at all. So they're just random people off the street. And also, we got to keep in mind that we're going through a pandemic. We're basically going through COVID situations. Some of these people that come to this house was not even masked at all. That could basically put me and my spouse at risk. Now, I know this because in the past, they have gotten random people to come up in here and fix these things. Not people would know they're not licensed, bonded, or insured at all whatsoever. Um, this has resulted in repairs not being done correctly and still ongoing issues with the same equipment like the furnace, the water heater, and everything of the sort as I mentioned earlier. Now, I have took a stand and contacted the city of Brooklyn Center. And when I did that, the inspector came out to our residence and found that there were several things that need to be prepared, repaired up in this home. Um, and in retrospect of that, what happened was when we basically did that, now we have a retaliatory situation where the landlord now just gave me this right here, which is non-renewal of lease. Best, I'm talking about, especially during the pandemic right now. So that means that she's basically violated the executive orders of Governor Tim Walz for protection for tenants right now as of this time. Obviously, I also support the legislation's goal to make sure that we are protected to reduce the court, uh, the court fees for the $300 that you mentioned about early in the conversation. Yes, that's definitely outside of my financial um, budget right now between my spouse and I right now. So I'm so glad and so blessed that y'all gave me this time to come speak to you, Chairman Hosman and the committee. And that's basically my testimony that I wanted to share with you guys, because it is definitely real is going on right now. Thank you very much for, for being with us. And now we have Jennifer Spadine from Guardian Property Management. If you're on, welcome to the committee. Please identify yourself for the record. Good morning. I'm Jennifer Spadini with Guardian Property Management. Good morning, Madam Chair and committee members. Um, I own Guardian Property Management and we manage rental property throughout the entire Twin Cities area. I come today to raise concern for HF 398. A statewide minimum heating code does not recognize the regional differences in our large state, especially north to south. Our current building code recognizes two different zones, climate zones 6A and 7. Additionally, the minimum heating code does not recognize how multifamily rental properties heat their facilities. Commonly, older facilities use a boiler system, which creates constant heat, which flows through the building. A boiler system causes those in the center to be warmer, while those on the upper level in the corners remain a bit cooler. This language is a one size fits all that doesn't match the significantly different climate and heating systems within multi-housing, multi-family housing. Local housing maintenance codes can be applied in circumstances to reflect the local heating requirements. Additionally, the expansion of the ETRA to include appliances is problematic. It does not take into account the nature of our property management business practices as a whole. 
especially as it relates to appliances. For example, when replacing or repairing an air conditioning unit, this is a seasonal activity. Our suppliers have specific inventory available at the beginning of a season. If an air conditioner breaks at the end of the season or a part is no longer available, the cost of repair uh, might be a better investment for a new unit. When we are faced with a challenge of seasonal inventory, um, how can we comply with an ETRA in that circumstance? We can financially compensate the resident, supply fans, temporary air conditioning, among some other options to mitigate the situation. My testimony outlines a few of the concerns we have and why we oppose the bill. Overall, the legislation does not account for how rental business operates. Thank you very much, Madam Chair and members for the opportunity to testify today. Thank you for being with us. Uh, Representative Herb, do you have any uh, comments before we go to the questions? Uh, yes, just one quick comment, Madam Chair. Thank you so much. Um, I just wanted to address uh, one issue really quick around um, older buildings and multi, uh, you know, uh, buildings that have um, multi units. I did have a discussion with MHA about what would be the solution then in those buildings in which units don't stay, can't stay at 68 degrees. And I um, was not given an alternative. And I do not believe that we shouldn't pass laws because we can't find an alternative for how somebody should be uh, addressing uh, deficiencies in people's units. I did rent a unit uh, that was in the top level um, very early on in my life. And that unit was constantly hot because um, you know, because we were on the top level and all the heat rose, but we also had the ability to control that by opening windows, right? And so, uh, so the other units could maintain their, uh, their heat and that when you don't heat an apartment to a level that people can uh, comfortably uh, live, that there's nothing that they can do to do that except for get um, additional heating uh, units to be put in for themselves. And that with the way uh, rents have been going, sometimes people have to pay for those heat themselves and it creates an additional burden when they are already paying too much of their salary and wages in uh, just uh, being housed. And so um, I just wanted to say that I did ask that specific question. I did ask for alternative language. I did ask for what could potentially be done. And um, I was told that MHA would be working with Homeline and there was a meeting after my conversation. And so if there is more to update on that, I can wait for my uh, for the questions and, and our, testi our testifiers who are here to maybe provide any additional information that was given. Okay. Mr. Worth, do we have questions? Uh, Madam Chair, there are no questions at this time. No questions. All right. Um, in that case, um, Representative Herr, any, any other comments to your bill? Um, no additional comments, Madam Chair. I know we have two more bills, and I just want to be respectful of time in case there are other questions, so I can move into our other bills, if that you'll, is okay. You'll, you'll renew your motion then? Yes, I will renew my motion to, to re refer this to the uh, Judiciary Committee. Thank you, Madam Chair. Representative Her renews her motion that House File 398 be recommended to pass and be re-referred to the Committee on Judiciary, Finance, and Civil Law. And uh, um, because we're we're remote, uh, we have to we, we can't just uh, have a voice vote. The clerk will take the roll, Mr. Mr. Wilcox. Houseman. Aye. Howard. Aye. Tice. No. Badge. Aye. Bliss. No. Gomez. Aye. Hassan. Aye. Heinrich. No. Her? Aye. Jurgens? No. Olson? Aye. Barr? No. And Ryer? Aye. Madam Chair, that is eight ayes and five nays. There being uh, eight ayes and, and five nays, the motion prevails. And so that bill is on its way to the next committee. Uh, Represent her? Thank you, Madam Chair, uh, and I, mo I make the motion to uh, re to refer to re refer uh, bill House File 399 um, to Judiciary and Civil Law Committee. Representative Her moves that House File 399 be recommended to pass and be re referred to the Committee on Judiciary, Finance, and Civil Law. To your bill. 
Thank you, Madam Chair and Committee. So this uh, second bill, the House File 399, this bill deals, deals with two issues. The first uh, for, uh, is fees for non-optional services and privacy. It's, it's pretty uh, straightforward. Um, uh, the first point is an increasing number of landlords are, are charging non-refundable fees for non-optional services rather than including the cost in uh, the advertised rent. Um, as you will hear from our testifiers today, some lease include fees such as move-in fees or January fees or just, uh, you know, really random fees that uh, tenants or potential tenants are not informed of ahead of time. Um, and that the uh, ask is that uh, that if there are legitimate fees, that those fees, fees are upfront or that they're built right into the um, into the monthly uh, uh, fees or monthly um, rentals, uh, that that would be the most uh, the, the best and most transparent way to do it so that uh, potential tenants know how to budget themselves for the units that they want to rent. Uh, the second part is regarding privacy. Uh, current state statute issues the subjective term of reasonable notice for how much advance notice a landlord must provide before entering a tenant's home for non-emergency issues. Um, and, uh, and our uh, testifiers today will also uh, talk to the subjectivities that lead to some serious violations of renters' uh, privacy. And so with that, Madam Chair, I will turn it over to my first testifier, which I believe is uh, Samuel oh, Spade. With Samuel me. Spade, yes. Uh, um, Mr. Spade, welcome back. Thank you. Uh, so again, we've provided a uh, packet. Again, pack Samuel Spade from Homeline. Oh, sorry about that. Yes, uh, Samuel Spade from Homeline. Uh, we've provided a packet of materials on this bill for House File 399. You'll find a one-page summary of the issues um, and the proposals. Uh, you'll also find a set of six example lease pages with fees, uh, the types of fees that we're gonna be talking about. One important piece of context for this bill was shared in the testimony a week and a half ago and was also uh, brought up by Representative Her earlier and uh, today. And that is that leases are almost always drafted by landlords or their attorneys. And they're generally offered to tenants on a take it or leave it basis. Tenants don't have the ability to negotiate about that. And this is one of the primary reasons that Minnesota has an entire chapter of statutes, 504B, that deals with residential tenancies. Additionally, due to the lack of affordable and accessible housing for low and moderate income renter households, tenants are often put into positions where they simply must accept uh, whatever housing opportunities come their way, regardless of what the terms in the lease state. We frequently see lease provisions that violate existing Minnesota law. Yet the tenant has initial next to those provisions uh, saying that you know, they're okay with it because again, they don't have other options. Thankfully, Minnesota law often protects tenants from signing away their rights in leases. Many statutes say it doesn't matter what the lease says, the state law is gonna prevail. But there are some serious gaps and fees are one that directly impact the affordability and stability of people's homes. We are seeing more and more landlords charging fees for non-optional services rather than including these costs in rent. We see move-in fees, move-out fees, lease processing fees, annual fees, and more. Uh, recently, I spoke with a tenant who had to pay a move-in fee that was greater than $2,000, which is, it was an expensive unit. That was about one month's worth of rent. But the, that, that's what she had to pay to move in. It wasn't rent, anything else, it was just a move-in fee. And these fees are almost never advertised or brought to the attention of the tenant in any type of timely manner, allowing landlords to draw in potential tenants with a deceptively low rent amount, and then revealing these fees down the road, often only when the tenant is already prepared to sign the lease, sometimes even when the tenant is moving in. Most of the time, it's after the tenant has already paid an application fee, maybe a pre-lease deposit fee. And if the tenant wants to back out at that point, they might lose that pre-lease deposit fee. And those can range from several hundred dollars to a thousand. In many of these cases, uh, the tenant is br being brought in with that deceptively low rent. Again, they they're, see one thing advertised, they go through the process, and then they only find out about these hidden costs after they have already invested some and maybe a lot of their money and time into looking at that property. Um, we provided, again, a packet containing several examples. We have several leases where the tenant agrees to an annual non-fundable administrative fee ranging from $100 to $165. Another one with a global amenity fee of $15 per month. I don't really understand what that is if that's not just rent. Uh, and that one is buried in a paragraph deep inside the lease. 
Uh, and this complex, this specific complex with the $15 per month amenity fee advertises all amenities as part of the deal. But they're not really. The, the tenant is paying more. One has a new account fee. One has a monthly administrative billing fee. One that I personally find particularly egregious is a lease which requires the tenant to pay a fee in order to pay their rent. And some of these fees, such as the global amenity fee, again, are just buried in the lease. You, tenants obviously should read their lease, but many would have to read it very carefully, thoroughly, uh, and pay close attention to every word to even see that these fees exist when they're looking over their lease. And I think it's worth repeating after reviewing these examples that these fees are seldom, if ever, advertised. In a worst case scenario, a tenant might not even receive the lease until they are ready to move in, at which point the tenant may already be effectively committed, having passed on other options. This bill remedies that by prohibiting non-refundable fees for non-optional services and prevents tenants from facing these concealed charges after signing a lease. And I would urge the committee to pass it. I also want to talk about privacy. Uh, privacy in one's home, understandably, is very important for everyone. It's among the top 10 reasons that people call us, over 700 calls on it last year. And privacy violations can be a source of immense discomfort and insecurity. Uh, imagine suddenly having a total stranger knock on your door into your home and start wandering around while you are helping your kids uh, with their homework or maybe you're cooking dinner or showering. And I, I remember when I started volunteering at Homeline in law school, which was about 12 years ago now, uh, I went through our training, Homeline's training, uh, and the example of a landlord entering a tenant's unit while the tenant was showering was given as a privacy violation. And at the time, I thought it was just a, a hypothetical example, an extreme hypothetical example used to drive that point home. But it really isn't. Uh, I have taken this exact call several times a year. I took one this year already, and calls that are similar to it more often than that. This issue has become magnified during the COVID-19 pandemic with many tenants, including many immunocompromised tenants, inquiring on our hotline about their rights. We put up a post, our blog post on this issue on our website back in June, 2020, and it's quickly become one of our top pages, seeing 1,400 hits just this last month. Minnesota does currently have privacy protections in place for tenants. However, these protections uh, sometimes are vague and often, uh, more importantly, don't, ans uh, don't offer a substantial remedy. So we frequently see pretty flagrant violations because there's no effective deterrent. For example, many people believe the law requires a 24-hour notice, but that's not actually the case, at least not yet. Uh, existing law only requires a reasonable notice, and this reasonable notice requirement is very subjective and is often interpreted by landlords to mean much less than 24 hours. Notice may be given only a few hours in advance. Uh, in other cases, tenants are rece uh, receiving blanket notices for a week or more. Uh, notice that might say will be in sometime the week of February 8th. Uh, where the landlord then thinks that they get to walk in at any point on that week uh, without any additional notice. And a tenant can argue that these notices are not reasonable, but if they want to do that, the only way to really do so is to file a court case, often after the fact, after the landlord has already come in and violated their privacy. Then if they win that court case, they only get $100. And this remedy is just too small to be effective in most cases, and most tenants probably correctly, won't even file a court case or go through the trouble for this amount, which means that these violations go unpunished and there is little incentive for landlords to change their ways. Uh, and there are, of course, there are situations where repeated and serious violations do occasionally motivate tenants to go to court, uh, but they have another hurdle at that point, which is they must go to court while they are still a tenant. Uh, currently, you can't really bring a claim for these violations after you move out. So, they can only pursue these violations while they're a tenant, meaning, uh, as you heard the last testifier talk about, that they face uh, or could face retaliation from their landlords. Uh, this bill uh, would also remedy those issues by requiring a 24-hour notice from the landlords in non-emergency situations, limiting the landlord to entering between 8 a.m. and 8 p.m., and requiring the landlord to specify a four-hour window when they are going to enter. Uh, and if these rights are violated, the tenants would be able to sue both before and after the tenancy for a much more meaningful penalty. Uh, and I would be happy to answer any questions at this time or, or later. And we have uh, Drew Mayers with us as a, a second testifier. Drew Mayers, welcome to the committee. Thank Please you identify much. yourself for the record. 
Uh, my name is Drew Mears. Um, good afternoon, Madam Chair, and to all members of the committee. I was asked to testify today um, with my recent experience um, renting unit here in St. Paul and kind of in regards to these hidden fees and things that come up after the fact. Um, in my case, my partner and I, we were, we've been spent the past month looking for a unit for the, the two of us. Um, we finally found one that we liked. We decided to go ahead and put down our police deposit for the, for the unit. Um, and after we'd already put down that deposit, after we'd already paid our, paid our application fee, um, we then received our lease, which was 46 pages long. Um, and right in there were a number of fees that were never disclosed to us, never talked about. Um, and especially for us, that the hard part was it was told to us after we already put down our deposit. So our, our rent was uh, $1,095 a month, which for the two of us wasn't unreasonable. Um, but then the additional fees in the lease included, um, the first one was a $9 administrative fee every single month um, with no explanation as to what exactly that was for. Um, and another one that uh, really kind of made it not really possible for us to go forward with the unit, I guess it would be classified as kind of a, a move out fee with the unit. Um, it was required that when we signed the lease, we hired a professional carpet cleaning service to come in to the unit to have all the carpets professionally cleaned uh, when, we, when we moved out. We then had to provide a receipt of that to the landlords. Um, and so I talked to a few different places to get an estimate of a cost for that. And depending on where you go, um, one estimate was as low as $250. One was as high as $400. Um, then also in addition to that, if the carpets weren't cleaned to the landlord's satisfaction, we could then be billed a second time to have them cleaned again. And so worst case scenario, if like we paid to have the carpets cleaned and it was $400 and then we get charged again, that's $800. That's almost an entire month's worth of rent um, in fees that we were never told about before we put down our deposit. Um, and so for us, you know, we were kind of stuck in a hard spot where we already put down our deposit for the unit, but the between these extra fees, we couldn't really afford to move into the unit. Um, and so th there was other fees, you know, there was a, a cat rent that we voluntarily agreed to because we have cats, we wanted to keep our pets. Um, but these extra fees that were never disclosed to us, if we would have been told about them beforehand or if the land landlords would have been more transparent, um, we probably would have passed on the unit to begin with and kept searching for a different unit. And so, I mean, it would have saved us $100 in application fees that we were unable to get back. Thankfully, we were able to get our security deposit back after talking with a few different attorneys to get legal advice. Um, but really just knowing about these fees up front or even having them built into the cost of the rent would have made us, um, well, like one, much more knowledgeable, but two, it would have made it a lot easier for us to make a decision about a unit like this. So I think like it could be very beneficial for renters to have this kind of information um, in the forefront, especially as um, uh, Mr. Spade said, a lot of renters don't really have the opportunity to uh, say no to a lease. And in our case, we we're lucky enough that um, after repeatedly asking them for a copy of the lease, we were finally represented with it. Um, but our lease was supposed to begin in March. And I feel personally the only reason we received a copy of our lease is because I asked them multiple times to receive a copy of it. Otherwise, we would have it could have been another week or two before we received the lease. And at that point, we wouldn't have time to find another unit. So we'd be forced to pay these fees without ever being told them beforehand. So I think it could be very beneficial to a lot of renters in the area to at least have these fees be more transparent up front. So if you have any questions, um, I'd be more than happy to answer them. Otherwise, thank you all for your time, and I appreciate uh, being here to testify in front of you. Thank you for your testimony. We have one additional testifier, Joe Abraham, uh, Pergola Property Management. Welcome to the committee. Please good identify morning, yourself for the record. Of course. My name is Joe Abraham. Uh, good morning, Madam Chair and other members of the committee. Um, I'm a local uh, private owner and live in the same community in which we serve and operate. Uh, for the past 20 years, we've been buying and managing older apartment buildings, and we provide a well-maintained, dignified place for more than 2,000 Minnesotans to call home, all while keeping our homes and apartments very affordable. 
So I'm here today to testify about my concerns regarding House File 399, as I believe it creates barriers to me meeting the service my customers have become accustomed to, uh, which is responsive service at an affordable price. Uh, my understanding is that proponents of this particular legislation are opposed to charging fees beyond rent, particularly those that are not disclosed at lease signing or at move-in. So if that's the discussion, I'm in full support of that. I, I think full transparency is always the best policy and full disclosure of a list of fees ahead of time is prudent, it's good business, and it's fair. But, but I will say, though, that simply adding fees across the board into our rental rate, regardless of the need of that individual customer, is kind of an inefficient allocation of the fees associated with the needs of that individual resident. And for me, it goes in the opposition to full disclosure and, and transparency. I, I would like to see those broken out. I'd like to see them so that you know what each of those fees and charges are. However, I think they should be disclosed up front. So I would agree with that piece of it, but it's an important distinction. The second area of concern is something that sounds benign and it's consistent with, I think, what most operators do in practice. However, anyone with boots on the ground will quickly point out the inefficiencies and costs this adds to operations and ultimately the affordability of our properties. Specifically, specifically I'm referencing the requirement to provide 24 hours advance notice regardless of the reason for entry or prior authorization of the resident. The legislation eliminates the important word substantially, meaning even entering an apartment a few minutes earlier than the 24-hour requirement provides substantial penalties for the operator. So I really think it's kind of best explained if I give an example that, uh, that, that every operator faces multiple times a day. So we, re we receive requests for maintenance through multiple sources. They come in by uh, text, some phone calls, sometimes they stop in the office, email, a variety of ways. And in an effort to be as responsive as possible and as efficient as possible, we'll often offer to address that issue immediately uh, in coordination with staff that are either located at that site currently or nearby or will be there very quick, very soon. And so um, uh, uh, for us, it's a lot easier if we can send them in in that case. But, but um, it's, it's better service to a resident, it's more financially efficient, which ultimately keeps rents affordable. The penalty for non-compliance when we, when we don't provide that, if we're even a few minutes early, it, for, the penalty for non-compliance is so onerous that operators would surely adjust to become less responsive and ultimately less efficient. So I believe the goal of this legislation before you may be rooted in anecdotes of bad actors that either abused access to an apartment without a reasonable notice, or there are those that charge fees that are either not disclosed in advance either due to their incompetence or potentially just actually the goal of being deceitful. I, I can't tell for sure, but I am confident these are exceptions. If passed, this legislation is written will result in the inefficient combination of a lower level of customer service at a higher cost. Thank you, Madam Chair and members of the committee for listening and hearing my testimony on this today. Thank you for your testimony and for uh, being with us. Um, and uh, Representative Herr, before we go to questions, do you have any, any additional comments? Uh, thank you, Madam Chair. And I did just want to address um, Mr. Abraham's um, concern around the word reasonable, um, uh, reasonability or reasonable. I just want to point out that right now within uh, um, federal, uh, let me see here, federal fair housing uh, that uh, we were told that, you know, there's already protections for tenants because of the, that landlords are supposed to provide reasonable accommodations. And I just want to be very clear that when the word is used to protect landlords and that the re word reasonable is very acceptable and not looked at as ambiguous at all. But then when we use the word reasonable to protect tenants, now there seems to be ambiguity around the word and how will people be able to define that. And so I just want to be very clear that word is already used now uh, in, in language in which protects uh, uh, landlords. Uh, and also even words like uh, a unit has to be habitable, which habitable is very subjective. And yet we continually refer to those ambiguous words to protect uh, landlords. And then when we use similar type words to protect tenants, there seems to be an issue with that. And so I just want to be, again, fair and create a level playing field that what applies to tenants and landlords applies to tenants as well. 
and um, you know, and and landlords who are already following the rules, I I, I just I don't understand how then giving more clarity around um, structure of entering units creates ambiguity and less responsiveness. My parents are also landlords. Um, they've owned many units. They've owned commercial and um, residential properties. And actually greater clarity has been uh, much more helpful for them. We expect that when Comcast comes into our house, we expect that when I call somebody to come fix my furnace, which my furnace did go out in my home at one point, that I expected a reasonable amount of time frame either. And that when there is agreed upon that, you know, somebody is a few minutes early and the tenant says, oh yeah, absolutely. And there's already agreed there is no violation of anything that we're putting into state statute right now. So I just wanted to be very clear around that particular issue. And I can take any questions at this uh, point. Well. Mr. Worth, do we have questions? Madam Chair, Representative Tice has a question. Representative Tice. Thank you, Madam Chair. Um, I appreciate what you just said, uh, Representative Herb, but I guess as a, as a tenant or landlord as well, um, I look at what we're asking our housing providers to do uh, they are the owners of the facilities, and a lot of times it is on what the schedule for them is. In one hand, we're looking at a proposal to create a 24-hour notice to entry, but on the other, we're saying a 24-hour to fix it. I, I don't get how we're going to make that happen, and, and that there won't be uh, any conflicts with that, too. And the removal of the substantially is an issue in that it makes the proposal rather strict and without protections for the landlord acting in good faith to repair an issue. Um, have you thought about uh, removing the strike through on the language? Representative Her. Um, Madam Chair, thank you. And uh, Representative Tice, thank you for the question. Um, I actually take um, have talked to MHA and landlords and I'm very open to any um, reasonable uh, changes to the language. Uh, unfortunately, when I do have conversations, I'm never given an alternative of what I could include. Instead, it is just either, uh, it's not a good uh, you know, option and to remove it or to not support it in general. And so I'm very open to any language. I guess I, I will um, you know, put this to uh, um, Mr. Spade to see if he has any comments because they've had further discussions uh, on, um, with partners who uh, have uh, issues with some of the language. Mr. Spade, um, do you have further comment? Uh, yes, with regards to substantial, which was brought up uh, by Representative Thiessen, uh, the earlier testifier, Joe Abraham, um, that is currently in the bill. The problem is that it provides yet another barrier for tenants seeking uh, some type of compensation or some type of redress for the privacy violation. For example, uh, I guess maybe a better way to say it is practically what it does is it leaves it up to it up in the air as to what the result will be because now the tenant has to establish that the privacy violation is substantial as well as establishing that there is a privacy violation and so you know the the few minutes early example certainly i uh, i can talk about that more in a little bit but often what really happens is you have something like the landlord comes in uh you know and only is in the entryway and then leaves. And now the tenant doesn't necessarily want to take the landlord to court because they don't know if that's a substantial violation of their privacy. There certainly was a violation of their privacy. The landlord came in maybe with no notice at all, but they're afraid that when they go in front of a judge, they're going to be, have to argue that that entry was a violation uh, and not just a violation, but a substantial violation. And they won't be able to, to show that. And then that they'll lose, and that could cost them court fees. They might have to pay the landlord's attorney's fees. So what it really does is it, it prevents tenants from even wanting to pursue. And again, as Representative Hur said, uh, a tenant can always choose to let people in. So it's not going to mean that if a landlord you know, says, hey, I can come over right now, is that all right? The, if the tenant wants a landlord to come over right now, the tenant can just say yes. The landlord can go over and knock on the door uh, and, you know, if the tenant opens it, say, hey, I, I'm here, can I come in to fix the unit? And if the tenant says, yes, the landlord can go in. What this covers is if the landlord is going to do it, they, I mean, essentially without the tenant's permission uh, or, or, you know, to do a repair or to do a showing saying, I am going to come in. What are the circumstances where a landlord can do that? Uh, and, you know, it seems quite fair that a minimum of 24 hours is is sufficient or is is a good idea for a tenant uh, a, as a minimum, given these things. Because again, you know, they will need to be able to control the privacy in their home. Rep Representative Tice, follow up. 
Thank you, Madam Chair. You know, I would, I guess I would just like to reiterate that there are times when, when uh, we get phone calls or we get notices. There have been times when we've been notified by inspectors that the tenant is not agreeing to a time that they can come and inspect and we have to do it because we're under a timeline. It's not necessarily that, you know, we're just can't wait to get in. We have to take off work to go there, but the tenant isn't necessarily making the time to go meet some of these appointments. Um, it's the same thing with the, uh, you know, we talked about cable bills. They give you a four hour window and we let them in and we're still mad because it doesn't really fit into what our schedules will be. I mean, I can't see taking off four hours of work to wait for the cable guy. And that's why I got an antenna. Um, I don't think that having this is going to be beneficial, especially and when maybe an appointment is changed and all of a sudden the landlord has a chance to get in and do it, uh, do the repair. Now we're saying that, you know, because of all this and, and substantially and, and he's not going to do it. And that doesn't help anything. Um, I look at some of the other issues that were brought up too, you know, on a, on a refrigerator. I mean, that's, that's an Achilles heel for me because we have a refrigerator in one of the rentals. It was a new refrigerator found out it had a bad seal. Who would have known that there's a back order for seals like a month or two. It was ridiculous, but I have no control over that. So how do things like that enter into this as well as where I don't have control over me trying to fix it? Um, it happens. And uh, right now, my husband and I are babying our furnace, trying to make sure it goes through uh, the rest of the heating season and we can wait until, you know, we need to turn on the air conditioner. But that's that's just a fact of, of being in a place uh, where you have have appliances and, and things that, that just go out. Um, the landlord, it's it's his property. And, and when it comes to furnaces and things like that, they don't want those things to go out. It's very expensive to have to fix them. And then there, there's some freezing of pipes. Well, there you go. Then you got another thing. So sometimes he needs that leeway to be able to come in and it might be very spur of the moment and can't get a hold of the tenant. But if we want to have these things taken care of, we have to know that, and I need to know as a homeowner as well, if my furnace goes out and I'm not going to be home, he's going to he's gonna come and go whenever he wants because that's my furnace. And I don't want to have all the usher, other issues that go with not having a furnace that works well. And I guess I look at, you know, we try the best we can. And yes, there are landlords. We all, there's, there's bad everybody. I don't, I don't care what you point to, there's bad everybody. And it just really hurts when we're doing legislation. And we can say, yes, there's good landlords. But then I look at this and go, man, this just really scares me. And all of a sudden I have to be so careful about when I go to fix things because somebody might not like it and then I can get go to court. And when it comes to the fees, I think uh, Mr. Spade said, not many people read their lease. I do. I have a lease for my apartment. I read it and it's a lot of pages and there's a lot of information in it. You have to read your lease. And it has the fees in it. And when we talk about, you know, this is how much it costs to clean the carpet, how much do you think it costs the landlord? That's why we ask for as much cooperation as we can in folks in taking care of the property that they're renting. It really costs a lot of money to do this. And landlords don't have it. Not now. Not in this COVID time. Not when they're struggling to make sure that they're following all the requirements. Not when they're struggling to most, you know, I will tell you, I have not heard a lot of bad news about landlords and, and rents paid. That's good. But there's some out there. And uh, we also need to address that some people just need a crash course on how do you take care of your property? How do you take care of your rental? And I think we could do a lot better job with that and get that partnership. I will bring it up every single time. We need that partnership with our landlords so that it is a hey, guess what? I, I got time right now. Can I do it? And it's not a big deal. We don't have to worry about going to court or getting sued for crying out loud. If I can't go in and fix something and, and I have a time and I don't give the proper notice, I don't want to get sued for it. That kind of defeats the purpose. Um, 
I, I just, at this time, especially in this time, uh, when people have different schedules, I understand it, they're home. But, but in the long run, are we really doing what we can to keep our existing uh, housing providers and our existing rental properties? Or are we giving them another reason to say, you know, I don't know if I'm going to do this anymore. We can't afford to lose our housing. We can't afford to lose our, our multifamily. And that is always my biggest concern. And that's why I, I will say over and over again, and I know how Homeline does a great job of having some classes and doing things like that. Let's do more of that. Let's, let's really go say, you know what? We just need to have these partnerships. You need to know your, your landlord. You need to know your tenants. You need to know them. Uh, just legislating and saying, yep, we got a few good ones, but holy smokes, you know, we're going to sue if this and if there's a fee and blah, blah, blah. And I don't always know, but I also know that I can't afford it. I can't afford it. And then you've got things like the city says, okay, you can no longer use a $3 garbage bag. Now you have to use a recycling bin at 25 bucks a month. Or, you know, a garbage and recycling, but you got to have one for each unit. There's none. We had a duplex. Neither one of them had enough garbage to fill every other week, but I had to have one for each one. And it's things like this. These little things always add up. And that's what makes the cost of housing higher. It isn't just necessarily, you know, landlords trying to get their tenants, you know, and adding all these fees. The fees are there because there is a need. And the need is, if you want me to take care of the property, there are certain things I need to do and I can't do it, especially in times like this, when money is tight, it gets really hard. I am frustrated. It is really hard to get the emails and, and things from people that say, I don't know if I can continue on. And I worry about our housing. I worry about Thank it all you. the time. Thank you. Thank you, Madam Mr. Chair. Yeah. Mr. Worth, do we have others? Madam Chair, there are no other questions. In the okay. Queue. Thank you very much. Mr. Excuse uh, me, Madam Chair, but Mr. Yeah. Lockett has his hand up. Physically has his hand up. Um, uh, that's the testifier on the other bill, right? Correct. Um, uh, Representative Her, we, we have one more bill. I, I am tempted to just go directly to a vote here because I, I want to get your third bill in. Oh, uh, that would be great, Madam Chair. I just, just wanted to say real quick that, um, you know, Representative Tice and I have, have talked on a couple of occasions and I've heard her testify, uh, you know, her comments a number of times. And I, I want to thank her that I think that she really is a good landlord and works really hard and that the issue of affordable housing is a real issue. And I appreciate her as the type of landlord that she has been. I just wanted to address a couple of really quick things that furnaces are already covered under emergency repairs. And so, so there's already guiding, guidance around that. Also, I would just wanna add really quick that, um, you know, I, I agree that the, the property belongs to the landlord, but that doesn't mean that a renter gives up every single one of their rights to rent from somebody. I mean, Minnesota has a, you know, a huge renter population and to, to use the argument if somebody owns the property, then they get to do whatever they want. And if you pay money, what does that mean? You not, you don't own it, but you're paying money for it. And so, um, you know, the, I appreciate the fact that, you know, yes, the owner, the property, the landlord does own the property. The tenant doesn't give up all their rights to become a renter as well. And so, you know, how I, I just, I, I think that um, it would be really important for us to remember that piece of it. Um, and, you know, those additional costs, right? Landlords are already collecting one and a half months to up to three months of a deposit for someone to live in their property. Well, if that's not to take care of, I've been told over and over again by landlords that that is so that they can get the unit ready for the next renter. So I don't understand why then we're double dipping and asking tenants to pay to, uh, to, to clean their own carpet or to pay to fix certain things before they move out when they, they have that security deposit. Um, and so I just, you know, I think that though I, I know Representative Tice brings up some really great points and I know that she is a great landlord. I, I just wanted to point those particular things out. And the last thing is just around people reading their leases. Um, I mean, we did just hear from our, our one of our testifiers that their lease is like 50 some pages. Right? And uh, that's really difficult. And that I know that, you know, we, we should be able to understand some of these things, but I'm a policy person. I have worked on policy for many years. Contracts and policies are extremely difficult for the, the everyday person to read and understand. And so you can read it a hundred times. If you do not understand what you are reading, that, that contract doesn't matter. And I want to remind us that there are people who have language barriers. There are people who have education barriers. There are people who have 
uh, disabilities that prevent uh, barriers that prevent them from being able to you know address lease issues uh, to create uh, to have relationships with landlords that there are many reasons why and it's not just tenants not wanting to know their landlords when you live in a unit in which it's run by a large organization that owns thousands of units your chances of getting to know that landlord are really really small and so i know that those are those are very true points for a certain circumstances that does work but for us to remember that this isn't the case for everyone. It's not, not just a lack of people not wanting to read their lease. It's the fact that it is very difficult to read the leases and there are many barriers that prevent people from doing so. Would, uh, would, so with that, Madam Chair, would I- Would you like to renew your motion? I do renew my motion to uh, uh, re refer House File uh, 399 to the Judiciary and Civil Law Committee. Representative Her renews her motion that House File 399 be recommended to pass and be re referred to the Committee on Judiciary Finance and Civil Law. Mr. Uh, Wilcox, uh, please take the role. Houseman? Aye. Howard? Howard? Aye. Tice? No. McBadget? Aye. Bliss? No. Gomez? Aye. Song? Hassan, aye. Heinrich? No. Her? Aye. Jurgens? No. Olson? Aye. Barr? No. And Ryer? Aye. Madam Chair, that is eight ayes and five nays. There being... Um being eight ayes and five nays, the motion prevails. And the bill is on its way. And represent her one final bill. Thank Representative you, Madam her. Chair. Uh, and the final bill is House File 400. And I motion, uh, my motion is to pass and re refer uh, House File 400 to the Judiciary and Civil Law Committee. Representative her moves that House File 400 be recommended to pass and be referred to the Committee on Judiciary, Finance, and Civil Law. And we have Mr. Spade with us again from Homeline. Uh, that is right, Madam Chair. And I just wanted to go over the bill really quick. Yes. Um, I know we have, uh, we're have we short on time now, but this bill mm -hmm. allows renters to break their lease with ample notice if a physician certified condition, illness, or disability makes living in their current housing a health issue. Uh, we're quite honestly uh, sh uh, shocked that this isn't already a law and that the proposal has generated um, controversies in past year, but it actually is language that was actually worked by both Homeline and um, uh, those who, uh, who had concerns around the language uh, when it first came about. And so, uh, and, and that was before the bill even came before us last year. And so with that, I'm going to turn it over to my first testifier, which is Mr. Uh, Spade. And I think we also have NAMI uh, waiting to testify yes. as well, Madam Chair. Yes. Welcome back, Mr. Spade. Thank you. Uh, my name is Samuel Spade with Homeline. Um, Homeline has again provided a packet for house file number 400. Uh, this includes the same one page summary from the last bill as it's part of the same policy proposal, policy proposal. but you'll also find a list of laws in other states uh, that have similar rules on breaking a lease for infirmity. Uh, Minnesota law takes breaking the lease very seriously and for good reason. Um, in general, tenants in the middle of a term lease, a one year lease is the most common, can only break their lease unilaterally uh, for a handful of reasons. Um, if they're a victim of certain forms of violence, such as domestic abuse, stalking, or criminal sexual conduct, if they are called up or transferred to active military service, if all tenants on the lease die, if the building is condemned or otherwise unlivable, or occasionally by a judge's order. There is no current Minnesota law that would allow a tenant to break a lease or end the lease early due to a medical issue, however, as Representative Her noted. For example, a tenant may have had a stroke that requires a much more significant medical care uh, or an existing medical illness may become much worse, again, requiring greater care, making the current unit unlivable in some way. However, uh, if they are in the middle of a one-year lease or longer or shorter, any type of term lease, they cannot legally terminate their contract. And the financial consequences of breaking a lease, of walking out without uh, an actual termination, can be pretty severe to a tenant. We do take these calls regularly. They're difficult conversations to have. Our current advice to tenants has to be that they need to work with their landlord to come to some sort of negotiated agreement or hope that their landlord can re-rent their place quickly. 
if they can't do that, if the tenant can't reach that agreement, they're in a situation where they may have to choose between staying in a home uh, that doesn't provide what they need or breaking the lease early and suffering what can be very high financial consequences depending upon the lease. Uh, if you think about a lease that has maybe $1,000 a month rent or $1,500, if a tenant has to leave six months into that, or in some cases we've seen two months in, that can easily be thousands or more than even $10,000 um, that a tenant could owe in a worst case scenario. Um, we, are, also, we are running out of time. I don't know how much I'll, more you have. <laughs> uh, I will be very brief here. I, two minutes. Um, there is no federal law uh, that would allow a tenant to break their lease in these situations. Um, reasonable accommodations don't generally get a tenant out of the lease. At best, uh, it might require the landlord to look for a replacement tenant. But the real problem with the reasonable accommodations argument uh, that landlords often make in opposition to this bill is that it is ambiguity. If the tenant can't agree with the landlord on what is reasonable, uh, they might have to go to court. Uh, and that, again, can be a big hurdle for tenants in these situations where they have severe uh, disabilities that are basically forcing them to move to, to places that will, that will receive greater care. Um, the bill remedies that, by Representative Hurst said, is giving them a way out of their contract. Uh, it's a fairly conservative bill. It applies in limited situations. It would require the tenant to move to a medical care facility, so they can't just move anywhere they want to. They'd have to get a note from a medical professional, and they'd still be required to give two months' notice along with supporting documentation and pay rent during that final two months, during okay. which time, of course, the landlord could look for a replacement tenant. I'd be happy to answer. Thank, any thank you very much. Um, Mr. Smith, Sam Smith from National Alliance on Mental Illness. Welcome to the committee. Madam Chair, members of the committee, my name is Sam Smith, Public Policy Coordinator at NAMI Minnesota. NAMI Minnesota strongly supports House File 400. Most people with serious mental illnesses live in the community in their own apartments, but recovery from mental illness is rarely linear. Some will experience a relapse in their symptoms after a period of stability, while others may face a mental health crisis for the first time. This can lead to hospitalization. After inpatient psychiatric care, it is common for someone to receive treatment at an intensive residential treatment services or ERTS facility for up to 90 days. Others may end up at an OCA regional treatment center or a corporate foster care home. Well, in a residential treatment setting, it is difficult for people to pay their rent. They may have lost their job. Their income might be paying for the room and board costs of a facility. They may not have access to phone numbers, etc. If you don't pay your rent, you will likely be evicted. Well, you might say, well, they don't need that apartment anyway. Anyway, they aren't living there. The real problem is that having an eviction record makes it harder to find housing in the future. This bill will provide tenants with an opportunity to terminate their lease on the recommendation of a mental health professional with two weeks, two months notice. The threshold for terminating a lease under House File 400 is high and will only benefit people with serious mental illnesses who will not be returning to their home in the near future due to the level of treatment needed. Without House File 400, people with mental illnesses face an impossible choice where they must choose between seeking the treatment they need and risking an eviction delaying the intensive mental health treatment they need or leaving treatment early. Many people who reside in an ERTS program or a corporate foster care setting want to return and live independently in the community. An eviction would make this process harder. We should not punish renters with an eviction for seeking the treatment they need for a serious mental illness or other health condition. Thank you for your time. Thank you for your testimony. And finally, we have Mr. Smith from Minnesota Multi-Housing. Welcome to the committee. I thank you, Madam Chair. Uh, my name is Cecil Smith. I am President and CEO of the Minnesota Multi-Housing Association. I'm also an owner and operator of apartments in Minneapolis. I appreciate the opportunity to share my concerns with House, House File 400, the infirmity bill. As an owner and manager of rental properties, we deal with infirmity requests and, the rea and those realities on a regular basis. This is no doubt one of the most difficult situations encountered in the work we do. Fortunately, most managers handle this with compassion and care, and we have training which helps us understand these issues and how to manage them at our properties. This is because federal fair housing laws and the Americans with Disabilities Act provides when a reasonable accommodation must be made. Reasonable accommodation is a specific legal term which includes significant policies and procedures under federal law. This bill at first reading seems to align with the best practices and regular actions of rental property owners and managers. But as you look deeper into the language, there is serious concern with the construction of the language. For example, under the definition of medical care facility, 
It includes Chapter 144, which includes inpatient chemical treatment programs and a state facility defined under 246.50 subdivision three, which includes regional treatment centers. These aspects of the bill do not align with the outward description of the bill, which is to provide reasonable accommodations to those with long-term or indefinite disabilities. The definitions of a medical care facility used in this statute are overly broad and seem to apply to issues beyond those I believe we're seeking to solve. Additionally, we've attempted to understand the approach in other states, and we're completely unaware of any states which have adopted this broad of a policy on infirmity. Among those states with infirmity statutes, they have limited applicability to infirm seniors or are aligned with ADA requirements. Finally, the process of termination needs to be further considered. The language is unclear and could, and could create uncertainty for both operators and renters who wish to, to properly use the statute. For example, when notifying of the need for an accessible unit, it does not provide a timeline by which an owner or operator must make a unit available. If the tenant signs a new lease at another property on the 45th day, but is offered an accessible unit on the 46th, could the tenant be bound to both leases? Thank you, Madam Chair and members of the committee for the opportunity to testify today. The MHA staff and I are available to answer any questions. Thank you very much for your testimony. Representative Herr. Uh, Madam Chair, I have no additional comments. I know we're okay. short on time, so okay. Well, we can... Okay, uh, Mr. Worth, do we have questions? Uh, Madam Chair, there are no questions in the queue. No questions. So we do. Uh, so, uh, Representative Herr, are, are you ready? To... Uh, I, I am, Madam Chair, and I, I did just then with a couple of these extra minutes, sure. I just want to mm -hmm. add really quick that Absolutely. Um, I know that there is a um, federal fair housing uh, language that uh, does provide, uh, you know, does talk to uh, infirmity, but I just want to be very clear that there are gaps in that uh, fair housing, um, uh, you know, th there are gaps. And so this is just, uh, truthfully, like I said, it, it was the negotiated bill and, um, you know, our bill just provides clarity. I, I guess I'm a little bit confused at why um, the clarity actually is saying there's, there's less clarity because of it. But um, again, we are just trying to provide clarity and to fill in the gaps in which does not, um, is not addressed within the uh, uh, the fair the federal fair housing. And so with that, I would like to renew my motion to re-refer House File 400 uh, to the uh, Judiciary and Civil Law Committee. Representative Her renews her motion that House File 400 be recommended to pass and be re-referred to the Committee on Judiciary Finance and Civil Law. The clerk will take the roll. Houseman? Aye. Howard? Aye. Tice? Aye. Igbadje? Aye. Igbadje? Aye. Igbadje, aye. Thank you. Bliss? Aye. Gomez? Aye. Hassan? Hassan, aye. Heinrich? Aye. Her? Aye. Jurgens? Aye. Olson? Aye. Barr? Aye. And Dreyer? Aye. Madam Chair, that is 13 ayes and zero nays. There being 13 ayes and zero nays, the motion uh, prevails. And uh, Representative Herr, your three bills have, have managed to make it to the next committee. Um, members, uh, Mr. Worth, any other people seeking recognition? Uh, Madam Chair, not at this time. Okay, the next meeting then of the Housing Finance and Policy will be on Thursday, February 11 at 1030. We have um, Representative Erdahl and Representative Fisher will have bills up, but both of those are finance bills, so we won't be voting on them. We'll be laying them over for possible inclusion. Uh, we have presentations on housing issues in greater Minnesota uh, at that meeting. There being no other business before us, we are adjourned. <laughs>